Legacy Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps, and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What are we doing right? That goes in eternity. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hi and welcome. You're live here with me, Paul Stevenson on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com this Monday, the 20th of March, 2017. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend and are recharged, ready to go with the new week ahead. And I'll be with you here for the next two hours live. It's actually 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, at the moment, uh, because the clocks have gone forward over there in the United States, and it's uh, we're just four hours ahead of you rather than uh, the usual five. So 6 p.m. here through to 8 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time or GMT, and that's 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I have, I'm hoping I can uh, connect them here. Uh, I have uh, one of my favorite guests, I have to say, gentleman called Gary DeMar. Gary is a Christian apologist and he uh, is a lecturer, uh, public speaker, and he's the former president of American Vision, which is a Christian apologetics organization uh, website, uh, as well as he's got his own, uh, as a new website just called GaryDemar.com. And he's perhaps probably best known for his work in uh, eschatology, which is the study of uh, biblical end times which is very popular today, and we're going to be discussing the origins of what is largely uh, the most uh, common, uh, certainly the most popular view uh, of end times, which we um, often hear today. It transcends into the popular culture beyond uh, the um, beyond Christian circles, certainly. Uh, things like the Antichrist and Armageddon and uh, the great beast of Revelation, and we're in the end times now and all this sort of stuff. So we're going to be talking to Gary about the history of this particular theology, which is called dispensationalism. And let's just hope we can get him on here. Hello? Gary. Hey, Gary, are hey. you with me? Yeah, I've been having trouble, having trouble. No problem, no problem. <laughs> okay. How are you, sir? Doing well. Just ready to, about ready to go out of town. We're going to be uh, in Europe for uh, three weeks starting Wednesday, so... Very nice. What are you? Uh, which part of Europe? Well, we're we're going to be doing a Mediterranean cruise, uh, beginning in uh, Greece, Athens, and ending up in Barcelona. Oh, very nice. What is it? A holiday, or are you doing some speaking? Fortieth uh, uh, wedding anniversary. Wow. Yeah. So. Well, congratulations, Gary. Well, thank you. And you deserve it. Anybody looking at your <laughs> website wouldn't be able to argue with that. Yeah. Well, I can. <laughs> I, I could. Uh, uh, I this is it's coming at a good time. I we need to get away for a little while. So, well, so sometimes you need to recharge the batteries, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'll you do know. a little work. I've got a book that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finishing up just and uh, a couple of other things. But other than that, I have to write an article a day, and once I get the book done, that'll be, that'll be, uh, that'll be it. What's the new book about then? Well, this one's called Wars and Rumors of Wars. It's on. It's a, a exposition of, of Matthew 24, and uh, it's probably probably the most complete complete exposition of Matthew 24 that I've ever done, and it's probably nothing else out there like it. And I just finished it a couple of weeks ago. Now I'm going to the type typesetting and um, uh, and, and proofreading. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to that coming out. Um, all right. I'm sure plenty of other people are. I put a little note up on Facebook that uh, I was having you on to discuss the uh, foundations of and the you know, origins of dispensationalism. And I think there's about quite a few people who are looking forward to that. So let's just start. We're going to be looking at the 
origins of dispensationalism, and I said, which is essentially, as I understand it, the root of uh, what the phenomenon of Christian Zionism today, uh, today. But for the sake of, I mean, obviously these things do transcend into the, the political and the geopolitical landscape. But for the sake of this interview, we're going to be concentrating, uh, you know, mostly on the origins of this dispensational eschatological view uh, in in the church, which and the reason I'm, I'm I'm doing the interview is because it is aberrant in church history. So for I don't know ninety percent, ninety five percent of the two thousand years of church history, this view was not even known. It was it wasn't something that was even debated or discussed. It was just it wasn't there. So uh, for the for the audience, do you want to just give a, a quick synopsis uh, of what dispensational theology is? When I say that, what I'm talking about. And then we can go into it, if you don't mind, Gary, just, uh, you know, we'll go into the origins and the history of it. Sure, sure. Uh, dispensationalism, most people, when they think of dispensationalism, they, they, that God deals with his people uh, in, you know, throughout, throughout redemptive history in different ways. And so there's the, you know, the, the dispensation of innocence, and then the, you know, the final dispensation is the, the, uh, the, the kingdom dispensation. And in between, there are other dispensations. There are about seven dispensations. And that's, that in and of itself is not very controversial. Uh, if you go back and look at a lot, of, a lot of Christian writers and commentators, they'll say, well, you know, God dealt with, with Adam this way. God dealt with Abraham this way. God dealt with Moses this way. When you get in the New Testament, we're talking about the New Covenant. Uh, so that, that, isn't, that isn't unusual, and there is a history of that. And dispensationalists try to say, hey, because there's a history of that, that gives credence to a lot of what dispensationalism is today. Uh, that's, that's a huge, huge leap in theological logic, because what makes dispensationalism so unique is, is the role that Israel plays in dis, the dispensational dispensation. And right now, with we think about because Israel is so important to, to it all, uh, once that particular keystone is removed from the system, the entire system collapses. Um, now, it's not that Israel doesn't, the Jews don't have significance prophetically. They do. There was all these promises made in the Old Testament to Israel, and those, those promises were, in fact, fulfilled in the New Testament. Jesus says, I came to the Jew first, <clears throat> and then to, the, then to the Greek, or then to the nations, and thus that was a reality. So uh, what, 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 the, what dispensationalism has done is it, it has carved out a future period in which God deals exclusively with Israel as a nation. And that is what is, in fact, very, very unique, because if you go back to the early church fathers, you will see that what the, the church was defined as being made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Jews first, uh, the, 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 eth the ethnic, the nations were grafted into an already existing Jewish body of believers. What the dispensationalist says is, oh, no, 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 the prophetic time clock stopped during the ministry of Jesus when the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and it won't start back up again until God raptures his church from the earth, and then God will deal with Israel during this seven-year period sometime in the future. So right now we're living in this prophetic parenthesis, a time period which has no no prophetic significance in history. There was nothing in the Old Testament that said anything about it. Uh, that's what, what's unique to dispensationalism. And look, there's, there is really no call for this anywhere in history. And I don't believe you can make a case for it from the Bible itself. No, I, I, I have to agree with you. I've, I've looked at the scriptures myself, and um, I just can't see it. And you would have to be actually taught this particular position to be able to then, um, you know, read the scriptures through that lens and you know with it as already as a foundational belief system to be able to extrapolate that from the scriptures that would be called um eisegesis as opposed to exegesis if i'm correct guy yeah in fact you you made a very important point I, i've i've been doing this a long time and i have never met anyone who has actually come to this position on his or her own no, no one uh there there are aberrational aspects of this here and there, you know, but I, no one has really come to a position and says, oh, the 70th week from Daniel is separated from the 69th week, and there's a gap in between, and the church age has been created, 
and it, it, we know nothing about the church age in, in history. We're living in this parenthesis with, where even Israel has no significance, and then God's going to come back, and he's going to rapture his church up off, uh, off the earth, and then there's going to be a seven-year period in which the Antichrist is going to make a deal, make a covenant with Israel. Then the Antichrist is going to break the deal. There's going to be a rebuilt temple. Then there's uh, No one that I know of who is a dispensationalist today has ever come to that position on his or her own. I have found people, however, who have come to the position that I've come to, which is, has been in history going all the way back to the early church, that Jesus is referring to in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, is that Jesus is describing events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, and that the book of, book of Acts uh, fulfills this promise to the Jew first, and then, to the, and then to the Greek or, or to the nations, where the first believers in the New Testament are, in fact, Jews. There were Jews living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven, Acts 2.5. And you had this great influx of, of Jews coming to Christ. And then we, we, we see the Apostle Paul reluctant to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and then he sees the vision of the sheet that comes down out of heaven uh, with unclean animals on, and he's told to take, kill, and eat. And Peter says, I've never eaten any unclean thing. God says, don't call unclean what I call clean. There he's referring to the nations. And so there's one people of God. There's one tree, one olive tree, made up of believing Jews and believing G Gentiles, where the dispensationalists make up two trees. You know, there's, there's the Jewish tree and there's the church tree. And there's no such thing in the Bible. You cannot find this anywhere in Scripture uh, so the, the the position is suspect right from the beginning. Yeah, and and an actual fact, it's it's for anybody who has a, any kind of understanding about the the larger narrative of uh, the Gospels, and you know, you know, it's actually it flies in the face of of the, of the work and the mission uh, of Jesus Christ Himself. When when he accomplished this work, it, it said it, it brought down the divide. There is no uh, Jew or Gentile; they are all one in Christ. But yet, this is separated uh, the Jewish people, the nation of the nation, the earthly Israel, from the rest, which dispensationalist calls the ch the church and the church age. Whereas the Bible actually, you know, doesn't actually make a distinction. This is why they call us, uh, you know. Uh, replacement, or they you right. know, they call it yes, yeah, 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 replacement theology, which is you know a great heresy to be avoided. Uh, whereas you know Israel, as you alluded to in previous discussions, is the congregation. The word in the Greek is the same, and so what's the word in the Greek again? Um, uh, ecclesia. Yeah, ecclesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get the word ecclesiastical from it. Yeah. And you're right. I, in fact, I did an interview on Friday, uh, a radio show. And they had, they had, there was a young, young man visiting there from California, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, he was a dispensationalist. And so uh, the first half of the show, I made my presentation and they said, hey, Gary, we got a surprise for you. We have a, we have a real live dispensationalist in the audience, actually in our studio, and he wants to ask you some questions. And it was interesting. He was a real nice guy, but obviously not really aware of his position and all he was doing was parroting what he had heard, you know, in his his theological circles. And he brought up the issue of replacement theology. Oh, you guys, you believe that church replaces Israel. I, and I said, there, there aren't two groups of people out here. The, the, the church isn't something new. Uh, in fact, if you go back and read the works of, of uh, William Tyndale, he did not believe that the word ecclesia should be translated as church. He said it should have been tra translated as the co a congregation or assembly, uh, because that's that's the, the the what the word means. And it was the it was actually the king it was actually King James himself who insisted he had he had rules for the translators, and one of the rules was that ecclesi uh, that ecclesia had to be translated as church, uh, because. He, it was his belief that the the, uh, the 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 ecclesiocracy had had special authority and power. You had the civil authority, and then you had the ecclesiastical authority, and the state was over the ecclesiastical authority. So he wanted to make sure 
that ecclesia was translated as church rather yeah, than congregation. Assembly. Yeah, it came from more like a, it reflected more of the ecclesiastical sort of pomposity climate of the day rather than any uh, proper translation of the word. Yes. So anybody who anybody who wants to study this, if you pick up a translation of, of William of William Tyndale, and you will see that he translates ecclesia as um, as as congregation. In fact, if you look at the the Book of Acts. All right, we'll just pick it up on the other side, Gary. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll, sure. We'll, uh, all right. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. You're back here live with me, Paul Stevenson, on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm on Facebook at Paul Edward Stevenson. Uh, if you want to donate to the show, you can do that at Stevenson underscore P5 at sky.com on PayPal. I'm with uh, Gary Dumar, and we're just discussing dispensationalism and then we're going to get into the history of it you've probably got what about 45 minutes left with us today guy yes yeah all right great okay appreciate that thank you all right so yeah so we were talking about this ecclesia thing you're going to get to the book of acts so, so essentially this dispensational theology after almost you know 19 centuries of, of christianity has recreated a partition if you like uh, so, you know, they, they have made the distinction between Israel as an ethnic group and a nation and the church, ecclesia, stroke, congregation, stroke, believers. And and then we have this this whole situation where we're, we're now in the church age. And then when God raptures the church up, he gets down to his, his real love and business, which is Israel, after the Antichrist comes and destroys about two thirds of them. Correct. Right, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that was the thing I brought up to this young fellow. I, uh, and there's another fellow online that I've been I've been uh, commenting with, and I finally sent him a couple of my books, uh, e- e- uh, e-book versions of my books. And he just talks about, you know, what God, what's God's going to do with Israel in the future? And I said, well, God's going to kill two thirds of them. So for <laughs> for 2000 years. So the Jews have been waiting for 2000 years finally to be redeemed by God. But before God redeems them, He's going to, the two thirds of them are going to be slaughtered. And, and I had a debate with Tommy Ice. Uh, I've, I've debated him numerous, numerous times. And in a debate, I brought that up. And he said, well, yeah, that's true. But, you know, a, a fourth of the earth is going to be destroyed anyway. And I'm thinking, that's, that's your answer. Uh, not only is God going to destroy two thirds of the Jews living in Israel at that time, millions and millions of them, all, but God is also going to destroy. Uh, 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 25% of the the earth, and that's that's your answer to the, you know, to to the to the charge. And um, I said, look, uh, if you really believe this position, that during the great tribulation, uh, two every, every for every three Jews living in Israel, two of them are going to be are, are going to be slaughtered. Uh, Charles Ryrie, who wrote Dispensationalism Today, called it. Israel's greatest bloodbath. Those are his words, and I've got a whole list of of theologians, dispensational theologians, who hold a very similar position. They all do. And I said to Tommy, I said, "Why aren't you telling the Jews to get out of Israel? Because for every three that are there, two of them are going to be killed. Why is it that there is a a, a ministry called On Wings of Eagles, which is designed to bring Jews to Israel? It makes no sense." Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, like the whole system itself. Um, but, you know, I think it's important uh, for people to understand between this national ethnic group. I, I mentioned earlier that Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus' ministry brought down the partition. Uh, there, There is no Jew or Gentile and all are, all are one in Christ. And then we have Paul who labored on this point. Um, you know, verses like Romans 9, 6, when he says, reading the King James Bible, not it's not as though the word of God has, has not taken place, referring to the fact that not all Israel the, uh, and the Jews were saved, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So you can just explain that to people so people can understand the distinction between this modern-day state of Israel and what the Christians for 2,000 years and, you know, and, and the congregation before Christ actually came understood Israel to be. Yeah, in fact, if you, you were reading the, uh, you were mentioning the dividing wall, Ephesians chapter 2, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who, who formerly were far off have been brought near 
by the blood of Christ. There he's, t- he's talking about non-Jews, for he himself is our peace, who made both one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments and ordinances that in himself he might make the two into one new man establishing peace. I mean, I don't know how clear Jesus, or here in this case, Paul, could have made it. It's There's one group. There aren't two groups. Um, and one, one of the things that dispensationalists, a lot of modern dispensationalists, or pop dispensationalists, as I like to call them, the cro- prophecy clock starts back up again when the, ra- when the so-called rapture takes place. Israel has no prophetic significance. And a lot of dispensationalists, moder- a lot of modern dispensationalists today have no idea that, that is the, that's their position. And so when people say, well, look what the Jews are back in their land, wait a minute, you can't make the Jews back in their land have anything to do with Bible prophecy, because according to your position, the rapture was supposed to have taken place at any moment. It could take place at any time. So if you're saying that Israel becoming a nation again in 1948 is a prophetic sign, then you have to maintain that, therefore, the the rapture could not have taken place at any time because it had to wait until Israel was back in their land, and Israel was only back in its land back in 1948. So that means before 1948, the rapture couldn't have taken place. It's a very, very confused system, and unfortunately, a lot of modern-day people who hold to the dispensational system don't even know what their own system teaches. Certainly, and that's that, that's an outright contradiction in their own system. Those two things cannot be reconciled. They, they, by the pure nature of truth, those two things cannot be true because they totally contradict each other. Yeah, not only that, but when you get into the Book of Revelation, you got the you have the seven the, the seven churches, and uh, Tim LaHaye makes makes uh, the point, uh, tries to make the point that the seventh church is the Laodicean church is actually the it represents the church today, and if that's the case. <laughs> then that means for the first six churches, the rapture couldn't have taken place because the seventh church had to come on the scene, and that didn't happen until the modern times. Uh, and you know, Tim LaHaye, in, in one of his books, uh, I think it was called The Beginning of the End, he, the two editions of that book, he said that the start of the, the end-time generation, Matthew chapter 24, 34, began at, during World War I. Henry Morris said the same thing. But in his revised version of the beginning of the end, Tim LaHaye changed it till destruction of Jerusalem. I mean, the um, uh, Israel becoming a nation again in 1948 because he was running out of the number of years a generation was. Uh, so, but again, most people who hear this from the pulpit or hear it on radio shows, they're only hearing the fantastic stuff. No one really gets down to the nitty gritty of the theology, and most people just take in what someone else says. This guy's got a PhD, or he's written a whole bunch of books. I really don't have to study this on my own, because why would this guy be lying to me? Well, he's probably not lying to you, but he probably heard it the same way you did. He got it from somebody else who was an authority, etc. You got to do your own homework on all this. That's how I came to this position. I did my own homework. Yeah, and I mean, you don't actually have to do a a huge amount of homework uh, to actually get, you know, to get the the starting point of there's problems with this. My own position was uh, I read Matthew 24 twice, and, and I thought, right, something's certainly not right here. And then I saw, you know, lots of other passages where there was a lot of eminent language being used until I came to the conclusion that I, you know, I must be a heretic. Uh, because, uh, yeah, because join, the, join the club. Yeah, a heretic. I don't know. Much. Uh, I mean, look at, uh, you know, I remember when I read this in James 7, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not, may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I mean, how much more clear can you can you be that, you know, this warning, James is warning his people about something eminent. So, don't grumble about yourselves, you Christians, 2,000 years in the future. I mean, it's just nonsense. Oh, by the way, you mentioned the Church of Laodicea. Uh, for any of our listeners who don't know in Revelation, you, I, in fact, the most edifying thing, I think, about Revelation personally 
uh, is the letters, um, but you don't actually hear them being quoted so much in Revelation because they're too preoccupied by the beast and, and all the other sensational right, yeah. stuff. But um, the church in Laodicea, for anybody listening, was a, a, a church that was set up uh, and Jesus was addressing seven churches and he warned uh, the church in Laodicea about their lukewarmness. They were quite wealthy and they were doing well. And he warned them and he said to them, if you do not uh, repent and be zealous, I will come quickly, which is another issue. I will come uh, and destroy you more or less, judge you. And, by, and so your friend who was looking at saying we're in the age of the church of Laodicea, perhaps he doesn't know history because the church of Laodicea is no longer there. The Lord did come to that church. Yeah. And if you go to the, the church right right before Laodicea, the church of Philadelphia, a lot of people, in fact, this fellow who was on that uh, in, the, in the studio when I was doing my my interview, I said, give me one verse that, su that supports the pre-tribulational rapture that the church will be taken off the earth prior to a seven year period. And he went to Revelation 3.10. And I said, look, this is the first time I've heard anybody go to Revelation 3.10 support the pre-tribulational rapture. And I said, if that's your verse, it's not going to help you because it says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon. My translation says the whole world. But the Greek word there is oikumene. It's not the Greek word for cosmos. It's the Greek word for a limited geographical area. It's the same word that's used in Luke 2, 1, that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world be taxed. It's oikumene. While, while Caesar Augustus would like to have taxed everybody in the whole world, the only le legitimacy he had, the only authority he had, was to only tax those in the Roman Empire. So, the, the which is this, that's the definition of oikumene in a lot of translations. And so, he didn't have a leg to stand on. This was about to take place. Uh, the revelation begins with uh, these things must must uh, soon take place. Verse 3 says the time is near. The, the, the book of Revelation ends the same way. The time is near. And I did a study on this. I looked at every single example of near in the New Testament and quickly and at hand. And they always they always mean, without exception, near, shortly, and quickly and at hand. Uh, they don't mean anything else. You can't make them mean 2,000 years. You can't say any moment. You know, the Bible does not say Jesus will come at any moment. As you mentioned from the, the James 5 passage, it's he's near. And, and near is defined as right at the door. Uh, so you put, you put all, again, you're right. You don't, you don't need to be a Bible scholar. All you have to do is be familiar with the Bible. Take it seriously. Um, I, I and a, and read a, it for yourself occasionally. Yeah. I mean, what's the problem with that? You know, it's just people seem to think that, you know, the Bible is just beyond us or something that we can't read it for ourselves. I mean, you know, Hebrews 1, 2, again, you know, in t long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers but uh, by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In other words, all in the past, we had the prophets and we had all these other guys, but now he, he, the Son has come to us, the, he, he has been revealed to us, and, the, and in these last days he has spoken to us, whom he appointed the heir of all things. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there is no ambiguity here. And another thing, I have looked through the New Testament, and I have looked again, and I have looked again, and there is no prophecies about the, the return of the Jews to that land. And, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked. It's not in there. Oh, I know. I, a lot of people are stymied by that. I said there's no passage in the New Testament that says Israel will return to, to their land, which, which affords no, no prophetic significance to it. Uh, there's nothing in the New Testament that says the church will be raptured prior to a seven-year period. There's no verse in the New Testament that says the temple will be rebuilt. All the things, the, the, the key indicators, it's like a three-legged stool— and not one of those legs is operable in, on, on a stool. You take one, one of the legs away, it's going to collapse. Well, they, with, with the dispensationalism, the three key factors, they are not found in the New Testament. And I've got a book by um, oh, some dispensations, a thick book on the temple, um, rebuilding the temple and all that. And he even admits there's no verse you can find in the New Testament that says the temple is going to be rebuilt. But he's written this big book as to why the temple needs to be rebuilt. And why there has to be animal sacrifices again, and and then when the temple is rebuilt, we got to remember that it's got to be destroyed again. 
And so the temple is going to be rebuilt again after that during the during the, the thousand year period. And animal sacrifices are going to be reinstituted. You're going to have to be circumcised in order to go into the in, in, and to, to, to use the, the temple and the sacrifice and the fat sacrificial system. And they'll say, well, that's for a memorial. That's just plain nonsense. In fact, that is that is heretical. Um, and if you go back to Ezekiel, where they find this verse, it says for atonement. So here you have the final sacrifice, the one thing the book of Hebrews is all about, the once-for-all final sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the dispensationalist has to maintain that during the millennium, their version of the millennium, there's going to be a new temple, there's going to be animal sacrifices again for atonement. I mean, it, it, it really is absurd. That is an abomination to Jesus Christ, by the way, who, you know, when the when the Jews, uh, you know, put put the veil back together again and, uh, and then and then God sent in the Romans, Jesus sent in the Romans to destroy them. Why would he want to build a temple again? I mean, it, it, the whole idea of it is just it's an abomination to the Lord who, who destroyed that whole system. Uh, because Jesus Christ is the ultimate uh, sacrifice, the atonement. All these other things were foreshadowing, as was the temple, uh, the body, the, the body of believers, and you know, made up of living stones, and uh, and Christ being the chief cornerstone, Christ being the, the high the high priest, the the one uh, you know uh, mediator between God and man, the, the man Christ Jesus. It seems to me that this actually, apart from being biblically incorrect, has a fundamental uh, you know problem. And the the understanding of what's actually going on with the whole scriptures as a whole in terms of the spirituality of it, uh, the, you know, with this not understanding these types and shadows, not understanding that Israel is a spiritual phenomena with those, as it was in the Old Testament, those who are obedient uh, to God's law, and, and the, that was the remnant, as opposed to the rest of the Jews, the majority of them who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and, you know, it just seems to, do you know what I mean? It's just a, it seems to be a fundamental lack of understanding of, of the whole thing. Oh, it, it is. And uh, it, it really is amazing when I, I finally sit down with, with people and go through all this. If I can get one-on-one -on -one with them and ask them some questions and so forth. Uh, I, I, I remember doing a radio show this was quite a while ago uh, out of Orlando, Florida, and this guy called in, and he was just irate with me because he had heard he had hold, heard about dispensationalism all his life, and most people don't, you know, they they've never heard anything else. They don't know there's there's even another view out there, and any other view out there is heretical. And uh, I always remind people that as we're talking about the history of of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a 19th century invention. The idea that there's a a parenthesis, the prophecy, prophecy clock has stopped. Uh, we're living in this in this uh, uh, period of time that was not prophesied in the Bible. The church is a brand new thing. That is a 19th century invention. And it was, fine, it was codified in the uh, Schofield Reference Bible that first came out in 1909, and, and the, the second edition came out in 1917. Uh, and people ended up, people ended up believing the notes rather than the text of scripture it's incredible the worst thing yeah i mean really it's people would take their schofield bibles with them everywhere they went and it was it was the interpretive grid as to how they would read the bible and so when you started asking people questions where's this give me the verse that says this they can't they can't find it uh and and of course because it's not there and their fallback position is well God still has a future for Israel. And I said, well, yes, God does have a future for Israel, just like God has a future for the Chinese and the Japanese and uh, Amer you know, American Indians and blacks and uh, Brits and every, even Muslims. God Never. has a plan for all of them. Yeah. Uh, and what I don't understand the, the question. Oh, Israel's going to get the land back again. Look, I have no problem. Israel is going to get the land back again. Israel, we're supposed to inherit the earth, not just a sliver of land. That sliver of land, right now, Jews living in Israel, that land doesn't do a thing for them in terms of their salvation. It does nothing for them. A rebuilt temple will do nothing for them. Animal sacrifices will do nothing for them. No, and I, uh, I'll tell you another thing as well. I mean, you've mentioned the side of it from the dispensation that holds dear to this. I have noticed... You know, this has really caused problems evangelizing people 
who are non-Christians and are certainly ostensibly not fans of the state of Israel. And I don't mind saying it. I'm not a fan of the state of Israel, looking at their record. I'm not a fan of Zionism. I'm not a fan of any of it, what's been going on over there. And I don't want to get too much into the geopolitical landscape, but I, I'm well-versed and well-researched on it. And I'm not a fan. And I then have to try and break down people who are not Christians and make the distinction with them that no 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 you know you can be a christian without supporting the state of israel because people say and I, I i had a wrestle with this myself you know and i say do i have to support the state of israel uh, uh, to be obedient to jesus christ before i you know got and researched it out of uh you know angst more than anything at, at the start and and then i have to go and teach people no the state of israel is not the israel of the church and go back and then try and teach them about dispensationalism but the point is it makes it very complicated to try and get over these hurdles to to the unbeliever who's not a fan of israel um yeah here in the united states um you know we have two basically two political parties the republicans and the democrats and the democrats are mostly liberal and republicans somewhat conservative uh the jewish population mostly uh, against their against their own best interest, actually, uh, continually vote for the Democrats. Well, the, the Democrat National Convention probably I'm going to guess it was uh, 2000, probably 2012. Uh, they were interviewing this Jewish uh, representative who was who was a you know convention goer, and he was he was irate over uh, uh, Christians and their support of Israel, and the you know, the commentator, the interviewer said, well, what do you mean? Well, it's because the, he said, look, the only reason, the only reason the, the, uh, uh, the Christians like the Jews is because it's, some, it's part of some end time scenario in which actually uh, millions of Jews are going to be killed. <laughs> I mean, that the, he, un, he understood his, uh, the dispensational system just as, as better than most Christians do. Their, their view of the future for for Israel, it actually is their near destruction again, and if you if you go back and study the history, uh, in, in a book called Armageddon Now by Dw Dwight Wilson, I don't know if it's still in print, but I'm sure you can find it on Amazon or on eBay. Uh, Dwight Wilson, um, uh, Armag Armageddon Now, and he traces the history of of the church's relationship to Israel during the time of Nazi Germany. And there were the, the Moody Press and some other, some other establishments, this was back in the 30s and the early 40s, saying, well, look, this is, this is a prophetic inevitability. This is what the Bible teaches. The Bible says Israel is supposed to go through this uh, Jacob's trouble and be persecuted again and go through this, this uh, kind of a Holocaust. So when they saw the Holocaust taking place, they, they thought it was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Now, this wasn't everybody. But it was enough of them that it caught the attention of some others and said, this is a dangerous position because it's the inevitability of war. It's the inevitability of conflict. Exactly. Uh, this, this is what has to take place. We're going to see a battle between Israel and the, and, and the, uh, the Arab nations. And Germany is going to be involved and Europe's going to be involved. And there's going to be a 10-nation confederation. So when, when there's talk about war... What are Christians talking? Are they talking about peace? No, they're not talking about peace. They're talking about this is inevitable, but we're going to escape this. And so while this war takes place, we're going to escape it. Well, Christians didn't escape that war in World War II. And if any war happens today, I guarantee you there's not going to be a rapture to, to, to have them escape any of it this time around either. No, and it's very dangerous, particularly when you consider just how ignorant they are of the uh, of the scriptures and what it says about this. Uh, I, I'm not in the habit of uh, trusting these people when it comes to geo geopolitical issues either. And I have heard people basing their geopolitics, many of them, in, you know, Christian guys with big profiles. I don't want to name any names, but, uh, you know, who, who basically, you know, establish their geopolitical positioning of what's going on based around dispensationalism. And I'm thinking, OK. You think that you're going to get the correct geopolitical situation correct from from a, a fundamentally erred 
eschatological posi position? I don't think so. As we mentioned before, you've got this, you know, Gog and Magog obsession with Russia and all the rest of it. But, you know, from the geopolitical point of view, you've got a bunch of Christians who have blind support for Israel that each president who comes into the United States must appeal to that bloc if he's got any chance of being the president of the United States. And that is some serious power the evangelical blo bloc have. And that bloc has blind support for Israel largely. And, you know, it's a very dangerous situation when all this stuff is, as you just alluded to, is, you know, prophesying wars and, and tremendous bloodbaths, including the Jews themselves. Yeah, I know. It, it really is startling. But, uh, of course, the Christians say, well, you know, we're not going to go through the Great Tribulation. Yeah, Everyone I, else is but us, you know. Lovely. And, uh, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they, they, they don't get it. And, be, and it's hard to convince them otherwise unless you can show them from Scripture. I mean, I've taken people to the very edge. And it was just like this fellow who was in the in the studio when I did my interview on Friday, and he says, "Well, it's 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 the it's the role of Israel in history." And then, of course, he brought up the thing about replacement theology, and I told him, "I said, look, I don't believe in re the, the church doesn't replace Israel." I said, "You know, Gentiles are grafted into the already existing, you know, believing church in the first century. It's like playing the race card. You know, the, you play the replacement." Uh, you know, the replacement theology card. When these guys are losing a debate, they say, oh, you believe in replacement theology or supersessionism. Yeah. And, uh, and I had a debate with Michael Brown over all the, this thing. And he had written against replacement theology. And I wrote this extensive article refuting him. And I had this debate with him on all this. And then during the debate, he basically agreed with everything I said, that the word ecclesia in the, in the Bible is not a new thing. The congregation in the wilderness, Acts chapter 7, it's the Greek word ecclesia. In the King James, it says the church in the wilderness. Uh, but dispensations have an answer to all. They try to answer all these things. But uh, we're making headway, though. I, you know, I've been doing yeah, this a we long are. time. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it is changing. All right, we'll go to break, and then we'll come back for 50 minutes, Guy, if that's okay. Okay, sure, sure. All right, then. Hi, ah, you're back here with me, Paul Stevenson, here on Revolution Radio this 20th of March 2017. I'm with Christian apologist and uh, former president of AmericanVision.org, Christian Apologetics website, brilliant site for anybody who wants to go there. And Gary's got a new website just called GaryDemar.com. And uh, we were just talking about uh, dispensationalism, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of it. Um, but you back with me, Gary? Yes. Guy, I, I don't know what you're like for time, but you, you just go when you need to. When you need to shoot off, just go. If you, if you want to stay for the whole hour, you're obviously welcome to, but just let me know if and when you need to go and we can wrap well, this it up. Next, this next break, I've, I've been swamped with stuff, trying to get ready to get out of town. and uh, get, Okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's great because you, you, you do, you're doing half, you've been doing another 20 minutes longer than I thought you would do. Okay. Um, so. Really, when you think about it, they're the ones promoting replacement theology because, as I understand, they've replaced Jesus Christ and the church with the national Israel and the Jews. Yeah, because you think about it right now in, in redemptive history for 2,000 years, their idea of the church has replaced Israel. Uh, and, Tom, and Tommy Ice, again, who, who's a you know, diehard dispensationalist and teaches at Liberty University and writes on this position from the opposite position of me, uh, he admits that. He says, yeah, the, you know, the, this, we believe in a form of replacement theology. And then one day in the future, uh, the, uh, the church will be replaced by Israel again. Um, it, is a, it's a, it is a crazy, crazy system. Uh, but the thing about the position is uh, it, it, it's, it's escapist. You, you as a Christian don't have to worry about how bad the world's going to get because you're going to be raptured out of it. The, the problem is they've been, they've been telling Christians this for decades. I mean, how Lindsay wrote that book, The Late Great Planet Earth, said everything was going to come to an end before 1988. And then it was, uh, well, a generation maybe not be 40 years. And then it was the year 2000. And there was a book that came out in 1988, why the rapture is going to be in 1988. And people have been disillusioned by all this. And a lot of people have lost their faith. Bart Ehrman, who's a New Testament critic, I mean, he, he even stated that it was you know, part of reading books by T Hal Lindsey and, and uh, Tim LaHaye that made him question the authority of the Bible because Jesus did, in fact, predict that he would return 
in some fashion prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in A.D. 70. He said, well, obviously that didn't happen. So if Jesus was wrong about that and that big chunk of Scripture, he, had, he was probably wrong about other things too. But I don't believe Jesus was wrong. He was very right on the money uh, on that particular prediction because uh, it was the, that generation and that generation alone. Um, I've got a friend who's a, a, a filmmaker. He's Christian. He's done a lot of things. In fact, he did some um, uh, Van Morrison uh, uh, takes and so forth. And he wants to, he wants to do a Monty Python skit on <laughs> Matthew 24 and saying, you know, hey guys, you know that that he's he's talking about us. No, 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 no. He's not really that. That you really doesn't mean us. You it means some other you in a different future you. And that this generation, it does, doesn't really mean this generation. It means some other generation. Um, you know, the rooftops here and, uh, yeah, we, yeah, our roofs are flat and we do do things on the roof and all that. Sort of thing. <laughs> That's really not talking about us. I mean, it, it is a Monty Python skit. And how, how dispensationalists try to manipulate the text in order to fit their end time scenario. It is a anomalous absurdity from start to finish, that whole thing. Um, right, so let's get down to uh, the nitty-gritty of this then. So we didn't have any of this for 95% of church history. Who invented it and why? Well, there was, right, well, you're looking at around 1830 or so, maybe a bit, a little, a little bit longer than that. Uh, uh, Darby uh, it was was one of the, the, the promoters of the, I don't know if it was called dispensationalism, and really the dispensationalism category of the seven dispensationists, dispensations was really the, the invention of, of Schofield, uh, and he was teaching this, and of, of all of the crazy things, Oxford University Press published a Schofield reference Bible with Schofield's notes. And I've never understood that unless there was something very political about it. Uh, you know, that, that, that's that's my understanding of it. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, uh, because it essentially took Christians out of the world. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, it took them out of any concern for what was going on you know, politically or economically. And that's indeed that is indeed the case. That's how I got into this talking about eschatology, because any time I went out and I started talking about politics or economics or education, uh, uh, any sort of things related to, to the apolo you know, apologetics related to all that, invariably somebody in the audience will say, well, doesn't the Bible teach uh, that things are supposed to get worse and worse and Jesus will come and he'll rapture us out of here? So why are we bothering with these things? So I don't know if it was a self-conscious effort on the part of the you know, Oxford University Press. They were going to win two ways. They were going to make a lot of money, and at the same time, they were going to take Christians out of the ball game. And in, in fact, that's exactly what happened. I mean, you talk about Christians today, about getting involved politically, and they say, oh, no, 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 this is the devil's world. See, Satan is in control down here. Jesus, <laughs> until Jesus comes and reigns on the earth, you know, we, we're living, this is Satan's realm. He's the god of this world. Um, and I always say, what do you mean he's a god of this world? Uh, he said, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that, you, that Satan is a god of this world. I said, well, where, where's his throne? And they're kind of mystified. I said, look, you, you believe that Jesus, Jesus can't be the, uh, the, the god of this world unless, until he sets up his throne in Jerusalem on earth, and yet you're willing to say that Satan is the god of this world even though his throne's not here. And they've never thought of that before. And then I said, you know, it doesn't really say he's the god of this world. It says he's the god of this age. I said, if you look at the context of Second Second Corinthians, you'll see that he's the that he has to blind people in order for them to 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 get to, in order to get them to follow him. I said, you need to read the whole context of this this thing. They're the the Jews of the first century who who denied that Jesus was the, was the Messiah were blinded by the old covenant. The old covenant stood in the way of their rece reception of the new covenant work of Jesus, which is outlined in the book of Hebrews. That's what yeah, that passage is all about. Yeah, exactly. And in the upper room, Jesus uh, said to them, you know, more or less, the rabbis don't understand the scriptures. And he said, I will open up your understanding so you can essentially have spiritual eyes so you can see how these things have been fulfilled in me. Um, but uh, again... I have heard this very argument, and I was I was stunned. I'm from dispensationalists that that, that that Satan is the god of this world. Satan rules, and I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa! I mean, your eschatology is one thing, but are we now saying that Jesus actually didn't overthrow and defeat 
Satan at the cross? I mean, again, this is a fundamental, uh, profound, uh, you know, lack of understanding of the fundamental work of Jesus Christ and his ministry. And they do quote some of the passages you mentioned, and I always point them to Matthew 28, 18. And I say, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, what is your problem with that one? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Uh, that means uh, all. Uh, there is no authority left for Satan. I mean, what is the problem here? Yeah, and it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I mean, I, I, it's, it's just a, a mystery to me, but people pick and choose verses out of context. I always use this little you know, deal. You know, if, you, 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 if you're not familiar with the context of a Scripture passage, you, it can be a pretext for, every, for anything and usually for error. And I say, you know, the Judas went out and hanged himself. Go thou and do likewise. Whatever thou doest, do quickly, because there is no God. <laughs> those are all. Those are three legitimate Bible, four legitimate Bible verses, but in their context, they mean something completely different. So when you look at the passage in Second Corinthians four, I think it is about Satan as the god of this world. The context there is that the that the Jews of that time were in fact blinded by the old by the old covenant. That the 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 adv the adversary was blinding them. Uh, you can see this in Mark chapter seven, where they talk about how Jesus talks about how they they nullify the word of God through their traditions. Yeah, uh, and uh, and and so it's it's just it is a mystery to me uh, uh, yeah, well. that these. But but again, a lot of it comes about because there's just general ignorance of the Bible, and then people just follow. You know, they, they, it's like the blind leading the blind. They follow somebody who they believe is an authority. It sounds great. He's a good speaker, lays out some of this exciting scenario in the future and so forth. Um, and uh, they just they, they buy into it because it is kind of exciting that God's going to rapture us out and save us from all this. That that's a whole lot. That, that's more exciting than to say this already took place in the past. Yeah, it is. And I guess there's more money to be made from books and stuff like that. But as, as you said earlier, um, you know, th this th this type of thinking within dispensationalism is, is a throwback to to the rabbi's interpretation of the scriptures. And, uh, I, you know, Jesus, he said, I, I'll open your eyes to to what the scriptures actually say. I don't think Jesus was that impressed by the rabbinical uh, interpretation of the scriptures, to put it mildly. Uh, again, you know, they you look at uh, Colossians 2.15. Where does this leave any room for, uh, you know, that Satan is the ruler of this world? He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by trying for, triumphing, triumphing over them uh, in him. So he's talking about the cross here. He just made a mockery of them by tri triumphing over them. Uh, that sounds like a victory to me, and yet they still maintain that this is Satan's, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, and, his... and we, have to, we also have to remember that Satan is a creature. Uh, he, he is, he's, 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 a, he's a, uh, an army of one when he's out doing one thing somewhere else. He's not, he's not doing it here. Uh, if he's tempting the, uh, you know, the, the leader of North Korea, he's not tempting Donald Trump. I mean, and uh, Satan has a very, very, very limited role in, in what's happening today. If any at all, people say, what about all the sin in the world? Read the book of James. The book of James talks about where evil comes from, and he never blames it on the devil. It's us. We're the problem. If Satan were to go away, sin wouldn't go away. We don't need the devil to make us sinners. We're sinners by by nature. We are what we are by nature. It's not because Satan makes us do things. This is, I don't know. Well, you know. He, 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 he does do a lot of tempting, but he doesn't make us, as James points out, you know, if anybody sins, don't be saying that he's been tempted by God and he doesn't blame Satan. But I think there is still a tempter, as I understand it. But we yeah, don't have to. But there was a, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, your audience will remember Flip Wilson. Uh, he was a black comedian, and he used to have this character called Geraldine. And uh, Geraldine uh, would always say that the devil made me do it. Uh, and th that's the way a lot of Christians are today. Well, the devil's involved in this. The devil's involved in, 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 in all, doing all these things. He's in control. Um, so he's not in control. Uh, he's, uh, Jesus has, in fact, the Bible even says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He's a chicken. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, can, he can't handle it. Uh, he, Christians he's over, just, he's he, overcome him. Yeah, he, right, he's, he's, he's overrated uh, as, as, as a bad guy. Uh, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. I always tell Christians, just get to work. 
uh, do, you know, live out your life, uh, uh, live out your salvation with fear and trembling, not fear of the devil, but from from God Himself, who's the who's the judge of all of, of all people and all things. Wow, this is it. Um, I, th- I, th- I heard someone use the analogy, you know, the Satan today, you know, after his victory, he, you know, after he's been defeated. You know, he's like, uh, you know, the Wizard of Oz when you've got the guy behind the screen, you know, he makes yeah. a lot of noise. He's very scary. But ultimately, if you had to go and look at him, he doesn't have any power. He has to keep you. He has to keep you deceived. Right. Right. And it's uh, well, anyway, it's it's uh, we're, we're, like I say, we are making headway. More and more people are beginning to abandon it. I I see it on Facebook all the time when I post something or someone else posts. It's amazing how many people come in and who take the same same position uh, 20 years ago, well, there was no Facebook 20 years ago, but 20 years ago when I used to do radio interviews, I would get attacked left and right, up and down, uh, over, under, sideways and down. And then, you know, not, not too often now when I go, go on the radio, I get people who agree with me that the shows are kind of boring. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, Gary, I read your book. It's great and so forth. Yeah, I, I came to the same co- conclusion. And so... But today I can't even get people to, you know, to debate. They they will not they will not do it. Uh, uh, they know that their position is is suspect. I did debate Michael Brown. He just kept saying, "Well, there's a future for Israel," you know. And I said, "Well, yeah, but I want you to explain the Zechariah 13:8. While two thirds of the Jews are going to be slaughtered." Well, he didn't have an answer for that, and uh, I'm still waiting for him to give me an answer for it. Yeah, yeah. They're talking about by debates, by the way, just side issue. I had a guy, believe it or not, I suppose it's not that hard to believe. He's a um, Bible scholar. He's a, he's going to seminary, I think. And it was a thread about feminism, and he weighed in uh, on the side of feminism. And uh, one of his friends wanted to set up a debate with me, and I said, "Well, you know, I, I haven't a, I haven't done a lot of debate, and b, I don't focus a, that much on feminism." I don't know. Well, you'd be interested in having a debate because, I mean, you're probably more qualified than I am. And, and anyway, if you're going to debate someone, you'd probably need three people, one to mediate and, and two. But this guy was an avid feminist, you know, and he's uh, he, he's going to be a pastor, you know. A lot of it has to do with how you define, you know, feminism. I mean, if well, feminism, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if, it occur, if it means, uh, uh, you know, abortion on demand, uh, well, that's that's not feminism because you're probably killing, uh, you know, half half of them are are, are, are girls. And in some cultures, they they'll they they kill the girls altogether. That's why China is having a having a a, a man woman problem because there aren't enough women to go around for the men uh, because they've aborted so many of them of of of, of the girls. So, but anyway, uh, it's a side not, issue. But, but I I didn't want to get him on the show just me and him because I because I have you know I, then I have got to be very disciplined and uh, um, you know I I could I'm quite capable of just putting an end to an interview like that really. Uh, ha- halfway through it, you know, so I thought maybe it'd be better to maybe get somebody and you know st- stand in the background and to be- have someone with my position debate them and uh, yeah, there's know, probably so. I'd, I'd have to think about uh, maybe, maybe your friend if you didn't want to do it. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of who's who's really who's really really studied that. I, I'd have to I'd have to think about. Let me think about it a little bit now. If I can find somebody, I'll, I'll I'll send you a send you a reference. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So um, you were just in the last sort of five or six minutes this whole dispensationalism thing then you know ostensibly as i've uh, looked at it, it you know it got a lot it got tremendous support and weight behind it from the publishing houses and the press because it's it, you know it, it's not going to spread like a wildfire uh, you mentioned oxford university um so i think this was a deliberate uh, agenda uh, behind it and um uh, so if you just look at if you, if you want to add anything to that and to how it actually spread um, and became so popular well, I think the what you're looking at the 20th century, you're looking at you know two world wars. I mean, it's pretty uh, you know when you have these wars going on, and then you you know you look at Matthew chapter 24 and talks about wars and rumors of wars, as if as if the 20th century is the only time we've ever had any wars. Uh, I mean, the first century there's there were civil wars throughout the Roman Empire, um, and there were earthquakes and famines and plagues and everything everything that you read in Matthew chapter 24 did in fact take place before that generation passed away and but see everybody tied tied their prophetic wagon to the wars it was you know and you can go back to the french revolution that was supposedly uh the uh the end and what's funny about it france france was the prophetic bad guy and russia was the good guy and then when you get to the to 20th century russia ends up being the bad guy it's gog and the whole gog and magog prophecy <laughs> And 
Prior to that, you go back to the Reformation, even before the Reformation, you had the Roman Catholic Church and the Turk, Islam, as being the end-time prophetic bad guys. He, he's the, back in the picture now again. He's back, exactly. He's back, back in the picture. Uh, you read, you lead, read Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth, and Russia was the big bad guy. Now, today, most of the books that are coming out, it's Islam as the bad guy. Uh, and so if the Bible is, is supposed to be clear on these issues— why does the end-time bad guy keep changing? Uh, and the, re the reason is, is because they got the time parameters wrong. They're looking at the wrong period of time. The right period of time is the, 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 the generation that was alive when Jesus spoke, referring to the, the destruction of Jerusalem. Not one stone here will be left upon another before that generation passed away. And there wasn't... Mean... Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, you, know, you know, people talk about you know, the accuracy of prophecy and stuff. You know, Jesus didn't give a vague prophecy about that. I found it fascinating when I read Josephus. Uh, the, uh, the the Romans came in and they, they you know, when they, when they burnt the temple, all the, the gold in the temple melted and it melted into the cracks of the stones and then the Romans cracked open every stone to get out the gold. They left no stone. There wasn't a stone left. Yeah, and here you have a, these, these soldiers go in and it, it was a bloodbath and there was a mm. famine. I mean, so bad that this woman you know, was cooking and eating her own child and gave, you know, and offered it to the, the soldiers. And they were horrified by all this, all mm. of this. And it was when, when, when Matthew says this was the worst tribulation that ever was or ever will be, he's, of course, speaking in covenantal language. I mean, when, when the people of Israel are eating their own children is a prime indication that the a covenantal judgment had, in fact, come after 40 years of warning where Jesus says, you know, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you better get out of town. Well, a lot of people didn't get out of town. They, they were expecting the return of the Messiah to save them. And Jesus had warned, don't look for, don't look for, you know, you know, there'll be false Christs and false prophets. Don't look for them in the, de in the, in the wilderness. Don't look for them in the inner, in, in the inner sanctuary, which means the temple itself. All those prophetic points were made by Jesus that referred to the, the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Yeah, and the Christians escaped, as the Revelation talks about, is flee with the woman and, uh, and, and everything else. And the, the Christians who believed Jesus, uh, they, they escaped Jerusalem and they survived. Guy, right, I'm going to wrap up rather than be interrupted by the break. Absolutely a, a pleasure having you on again, as always. Um, you're on GaryDemar.com. Uh, I think you're right. still looking for some writers as well. If I look, I'm at your always face. looking for writers. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll write you an article. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm always looking for for good stuff. It, uh, so I'm trying to build up the site and and offer more uh, writing opportunities to you know to people who like to have write and never had a vehicle as to get it out. And so that's one of the reasons why I started GaryDemar.com. All right, wonderful, and, and you know, uh, recharge the batteries and have a wonderful, safe trip uh, on your uh, cruise in the southern Mediterranean. It'll be lovely uh, this time of year, you know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, guy. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Okay. There goes Guy Demar. Um, and I just thought I would wrap up just because I tend to leave uh, wrapping up and when the actual break ads come on and it sort of abruptly ends and uh, but fascinating as always a wealth of knowledge and um, as I said he's one of my favorite guys to have on the show and his, Amer his, his site has got a lot of stuff on AmericanVision.org and his new website as he said GaryDemar.com so anyone who's uh, writing uh, articles any scholars or I guess otherwise uh, who've got interesting articles that they're investing time, study, and research in, uh, GaryDemar.com, and I'm sure Gary will take uh, those uh, you know, with serious consideration. I'll be back in about five minutes.